my colleague uh, Omar Siddiqui, and uh, my name is Liam Yin from Stanford University. Welcome to attend the Digital Grade Summer Webinar Series. We're going to have the last panel for this summer, which will be focusing on transactive energy. Before we start the web WebEx, uh, a few housekeeping items. Everyone is auto-muted when you join this webinar. There's a two way you can ask a question. The first one is you will see a chat or a Q&A button uh, down the screen. You can submit your questions through the chat or through the Q&A. Alternatively, you can raise your hand. We are recording this WebEx, so your participation is your consent. All the recordings and the presentations will be posted to both EPRI and the Stanford website. A quick intro for the host perspective, if you are new to this webinar, and uh, it's hosted by EPRI and the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative. EPRI is a non-for-profit organization and focus on the R&D on generation, power delivery, and utilization for the public interest and public benefit. And the Stanford is, uh, Stanford Bits and Watts is an initiative at the Stanford focused on the digital innovation toward the, for the 21st century electrical grid. Both of us come together with the support from an IT company, VMware, have the same workshop goal, which is to convene utility, technology provider, academic leaders, government agencies, non-for-profit organizations to develop a research roadmap for a standardized data platform to interface customer DER with the grid and inform an interdisciplinary and a collaborative collaborative research initiative. So we cannot do this alone just by two organizations. In the last three months, we got a lot of support from more than 30 organizations that participate in this webinar series. More than 40 speakers that deliver the talk or participate in the conversation for this important topic. So you're, if you're interested in the last 11 web apps, you can find the recording from both Stanford and the EPRI website. Today, I'm very glad to have two distinguished panelists, Ron Melton and Ed Catlett, to join us to discuss the transactive energy. Also, we are honored to have a special guest here, Terry Oliver, to help us to moderate this panel. Many of us, before COVID-19, many of us are frequent flyer of, of some airlines. And Terry is a frequent attendee for this webinar series. He attended, we haven't attended, but likely will be like 10 webinars in the past. And uh, many of us know Terry. Just a quick intro. Terry is the first chief technology innovation officer of a Bonneville Power Administration. He received the highest award from BPA, which is a Meritorious Service Award. He is retired, but not tied. And uh, recently, he just awarded with the Grade Forward Innovate Award. So today, he is going to help us to moderate the conversation between Ron and Ed. <coughs> with that, I will hand this to Terry. Terry, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Transactive Energy and Terry Oliver actually go back quite a ways, uh, along with these our two uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, it got its start in a planning scheme for the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise Demonstration Project, a joint effort between Bonneville Power the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and a set of BPA customer utilities on the east side of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State and graciously funded uh, in large part by the Department of Energy. We began by imagining what, what if we could deliver prices or values directly to devices? And along the way, we discovered that that wasn't nearly enough and that much more was possible and beneficial. 
A now retired B EPRI executive, Clark Gellings, made a name for himself and, and EPRI uh, by imagining a specific set of utility benefits that could be had by, let me advance this slide here. Uh, by changing load shapes in a, in a distinct way, uh, clipping peaks, uh, filling valleys, moving load out of the peak into the valley, uh, shifting loads, uh, strategic load growth, uh, and strategic conservation, something that uh, Bonneville Power and the Pacific Northwest Utilities took to heart and, and have made significant progress on. And flexible load shapes. And, and the latter is kind of where transactive energy uh, takes off. Uh, we wanted to go further, less in command and control, and more into markets. At the same time, we were trying to avoid the downside of the approaches of load controls in use at that time by utilities and still primary use, angry customers and small impacts. The kind of thing that you got when on the most extreme hot day, at the most extreme hot hour, you said, yeah, air conditioning, off. <laughs> in setting up the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise demonstration, uh, we assembled a set of resources, home space heating, municipal water pumps to elevated storage tanks and backup gen generators. Each of these brought an interesting possibility of flexibility. Homes could preheat. Municipal water pumps could significantly vary when and how much they pumped into storage. And large enough backup generators could offset major loads and possibly actually feed into the local grid. We set up a several year experimental plan and a method for calculating local and regional values and chain of resources aligned to deliver electricity to customers in the peninsula. Starting with the hydro generation values at the mid Columbia generators and including transmission values and costs from the mid seas to the peninsula, including that generation. When we had it all set up and in the dead of winter, we pulled the trigger on a big experiment. If we pretended that virtually half of the capacity to serve these loads simply disappeared, would the resources on the Olympic Peninsula keep the lights on while at the same time keeping consumers happy? And we did both. We thought that perhaps in a subsequent phase would be needed to deal with anticipated anticipatory load flexibility, it turned out that that worked right the first time. Uh, it, it worked because the, we also told the, the equipment, not just the current value or cost of electricity, but that we gave them a, a future value so that the, the equipment understood by the magic of programming that while electricity had a reasonable value at 6 a.m., it was going to be pretty uh, expensive at 9, and we found that homes were choosing to preheat. No consumer engagement actually required to accomplish that. So one of the things that we knew but newly discovered was that uh, well-insulated homes had a bunch of unrecognized value for uh, flex as flexible loads. And you'll hear in Ron's uh, presentation and in Ed's presentation uh, more about how we advanced uh, those ideas. So today we're gonna to hear about the work of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in systematically exploring uh, how that could happen and the work of the California uh, Energy Commission sponsored test of transactive energy actually applied in Southern California Edison via T-Mix. So let me introduce our two uh, panelists. Uh, the first speaker will be Ron Melton. Uh, Dr. Melton is the group leader of the Distributed Systems Group uh, in the Electricity Infrastructure and Buildings Division, a senior power systems researcher and project manager at the Northwest National Laboratory. He's the principal investigator for the DOE Advanced Grid Research Project for an ADMS open source platform. He's a member of the core team for the 
Department of Energy Grid Architecture Project and Administrator of the Gridwise Architecture Council. He was the project director for the Pacific Northwest Smart Grid demonstration that concluded in June 2015 and has 10 years of experience in cybersecurity for critical infrastructure systems and over 30 years of experience applying computer technology to a variety of engineering and scientific problems. Dr. Melton is a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer and a senior member of the Association for Computing Machinery. He chairs the IEEE Power and Energy Society Smart Buildings, Loads and Customer Systems Technical Committee, and the Smart Electric Power Alliance Grid Architecture Working Group. He got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Washington and his Master of Science and PhD in Engineering Science from Caltech. Ed Kasletz, also a PhD, uh, is the founder and CEO of T-Mix Inc., a transactive energy services company, and a founder and VP of Megawatt Storage Farms Inc., a grid storage advisory firm. He was previously a governor of the California Independent System Operator, and also the founder and CEO of Automated Power Exchange, the first online wholesale power exchange. Dr. Kaslett is a leader in the design of transaction services for electricity, the commercialization of electricity storage, and the analysis of energy decisions. He has extensive experience in designing, building, and operating high-speed, reliable transaction systems for electric power that interface with the existing transaction systems and markets. Ed was also co-chair of the OASIS Energy Market Information Exchange Technical Committee. He holds a PhD from Stanford, focused on economics, decision analysis, and power systems, and a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in engineering from the University of Washington. Welcome to our speakers. Thank you. Let's go on to uh, Ron's presentation. Well, thanks, Terry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to say, Terry mentioned uh, sort of the genesis of the work here in the Northwest back with the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise Demonstration Project. I think we should also recognize that uh, much of the work you're going to hear about today, certainly the work that we do at PNNL, actually has its roots back in the late 70s, early 80s in work that Fred Schweppe and uh, Richard Tabor and Jim Kirtley were doing at MIT on something that they called homeostatic control. Uh, the uh, techniques for engaging uh, customers and the flexibility of loads of customers were, were uh, greatly laid out by uh, that work that they did. There's an MIT uh, technical report, MIT-EL uh, B1-033, or maybe that's 81-033, that um, is uh, uh, searchable. You, know, you can find that online if you're interested in going back into the uh, history of the field. What I want to talk to you about today are sort of uh, four things. And I'm going to go fairly quickly because uh, I have a lot of slides to cover. But we'll give you a little bit of background and context, uh, some of the motivations for transactive energy. For, uh, Terry alluded to this when he talked about the flexibility aspect of loads. Uh, I talk about some of the sort of foundations uh, for laying out a framework for discussing transactive energy systems to have a common way of referring to things, a, a, a nomenclature, a taxonomy, if you will, and a roadmap uh, for, uh, for the development of transactive energy system technologies at scale, that work coming from the Gridwise Architecture Council. Then a little bit of a grid architecture perspective coming out of our grid architecture work. And finally, a quick uh, uh, overview of the various things we're doing at PNNL and transactive systems research. So motivations, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this because I think you're all pretty well familiar with this, but basically the energy system is changing uh, and changing dramatically with the introduction of uh, renewable uh, resources uh, at large scales. And as we get more and more of those uh, resources, distributed energy resources in particular, and we also get increasing amount of distribution automation and other intelligent devices spread throughout distribution systems, the, the old uh, techniques are just not uh, going to work anymore. And so we need new techniques 
that uh, are able to harness the flexibility that's brought by the distributed energy resources and be able to take advantage of uh, edge computing and other uh, advances in terms of the technology that's laying in front of us in the electric power system to take advantage of those changes. So we have a, we have a, a number of ideas here about how uh, uh, we might you know, engage these different devices. First, taking into account owner's interests. We sometimes refer to this also as boundary deference. Uh, and this, this calls us to think about not necessarily how to control, as Terry mentioned, not, it's not about controlling the devices on the hottest day at the hottest hour, it's about coordination and uh, incentivizing behaviors. As we do that, we need to we need to have some sense of uh, what will in fact happen, and so we need some sense of performance agreement so that we can have services requested and, and the responses to those services offered, and know something about what's actually going to happen. And the, one of the ways we do that is, of course, with markets, and the markets both give us a chance for some uh, market-based uh, optimization and efficiency, and they also give us a chance to use those incentives that I mentioned. We need to uh, provide access to this to all, all interested parties, and we need to make it simple. We need to have it to the greatest extent possible, some form of plug and play integration. Now, Terry mentioned the, the work on the Olympic Peninsula, and uh, we used a, a double auction market. Uh, Dave, Dave Tassin was a part of that. I see Dave is on the, on the call today. And uh, the market, as I recall, was uh, designed uh, in consultation with Lynn Kiesling. Um, and basically, uh, the, the slide here gives you a general idea here. There's automated price responsive devices. They have some curve that uh, tells how they will respond to a uh, to a, uh, elasticity of price. Um, the various systems in a home are aggregated together. They give you the overall price flexibility curve for that home. The uh, service provider aggregates the curves from the customers that say what they will do at what price. They clear the market, they send out the, the clearing price, the devices behave according to what they said they would do at what price, either they get to play or they don't, and you just repeat that loop over and over again in time on the Olympic Peninsula project that Terry mentioned, that was a five minute time interval. And this uh, work uh, and the foundations of that work, the things we learned sort of led to many of the discussions that have taken place in the Gridwise Architecture Council. And we spent a great deal of time uh, debating uh, uh, over about a six month period definition for transactive energy that you see on this slide, a set of economic and control mechanisms. And so we recognized the, the use of the economic techniques, the markets, but also uh, from a reliability and resilience point of view, the need to have some sense of uh, treating this also as a control system to have the dynamic balance of supply and demand be uh, uh, coordinated through the use of value as an operational parameter for, and otherwise uh, economic signals. Uh, we don't use value uh, precisely in the economic terms here, but value in the sense of we want to t uh, figure out how to monetize things. How do we monetize, for example, comfort so that one can transact on comfort with a, with a, a smart thermostat in somebody's house? We also uh, generally agreed that these are gonna be uh, distributed systems and that there's uh, various various things that they might do for people. Uh, this was all pulled together in the Transactive Energy Framework document, the second version of which, version 1.1, was uh, published in July 2009. Uh, it's available at goodwiseac.org. And this both includes definitions. It also uh, lists a number of attributes of a TE system. For example, uh, who are the transacting parties? What is the transaction mechanism? What is the extent of the system? Is it just in a distribution system? Is it from end to end, from transmission through to end use, et cetera? And also, uh, uh, we identified in the second version uh, six TE principles that we'll go over in just a minute. And we uh, then discussed in more detail um, the context for deploying TE systems from a perspective of policy and market design, business models and value realization, uh, provide some conceptual architecture guidelines, and then some discussion of cyber physical infrastructure related to the implementation and deployment of TE systems. Uh, let's see, there we go, my screen just went blank, but we're back. Okay, so the six transactive energy principles that we uh, came up with, these were discussed at a meeting at PJM about, uh, about 2010 or 2011. 
and uh, we had uh, agreement across a number of participants at that meeting on these six ideas. First, that these systems require highly automated uh, approaches and that's a form of coordinated self-optimization. We'll talk often about uh, greedy local optimization. Uh, they need to provide the non-discriminatory participation by anybody that's qualified to participate, has the necessary devices and, and uh, uh, systems. And you saw that just a few minutes ago, that uh, there's some sense of accountability that has to be in place that uh, is applied to the transacting parties so they, they can't say they'll do something and then not do it without any, any uh, repercussions. That uh, observability and auditability at all interfaces is required. Uh, one has to be able to sort of book the transactions, if you will, and so uh, has to see what's going on to do that. And also there's some sense of situational awareness that may be needed. There's a need to uh, consider reliability and control while doing this optimal integration and coordination of the DER. And that, you know, for practical purposes, these systems need to be scalable, adaptable, extensible, et cetera across a variety of different uh, DER and a variety of different participants and geographic extents. So these form, if you will, a set of high-level requirements for TE systems. Um, the, the work of the Council further uh, sort of builds on the uh, GWAC stack, the, the uh, stack of interoperability that comes from the Council's interoperability context setting framework. And we can recognize those four, uh, four sections that I mentioned from the TE framework also correspond to breaking the eight levels of the GWAC stack into, into four paired levels from the uh, very basic uh, technical levels below up to the organizational uh, considerations of uh, regulatory and policy and business objectives. Taking that particular view and combining it with the uh, TE roadmap stages that we got from the work that Paul Martini and Lorenzo Christoph have done for the Future Utility Electric Utility Regulators project at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, where they defined three stages of, uh, of adoption of distributed energy resources, a low adoption rate where uh, prices are basically uh, coming from administrative uh, mandates of things like feed-in tariffs, to a moderate level of adoption where you actually have enough DER in a system that you can aggregate it and potentially interact with an organized market and establish value that way up to very high adoption where in fact local value can be established through interactions within a distribution system, for example. So using those principles and those three stages, we created in the TE roadmap a structure that you see like this where we consider the four areas we consider the three stages and within each of those four areas and across the three stages, we look at what, what, were the, what are the benefits that would accrue from uh, transactive energy systems, what are the re results, or actually working our way down, what's the vision of what could be done, what are the things that are required to enable that vision, uh, what are the results then if one is able to do that, and what are the benefits to, uh, to all the interested stakeholders when one does that. Uh, we don't have time to go into details on this today, but you can take a look at the roadmap yourself. It's intended to answer the question, what's required to actually be able to deploy and operate these types of systems at scale in utilities? So switching gears now, um, you mentioned that coordination is extremely important as opposed to control, that one of the reasons for going to a transactive energy approach is to, is to be able to do coordination. And we spent a little bit of time in the grid architecture work considering that as well. Um, and, and you see here this uh, notion of coordination sort of uh, looking at the various new interfaces that come into play and also at some of the structural considerations as we move to things like distribution system operator concepts and have the, have the ability to coordinate what's happening in a distribution system with the operation of the distribution system avoiding you know, bypassing that you see, for example, in the uh, figure in the uh, upper left where the uh, microgrids are communicating directly with the TSO. As we look at that need for coordination and the roles and responsibilities, one of the things that we did in the grid architecture work, uh, just one, there's a lot of other uh, work coming out of the, that uh, project that's also relevant, but we took a look at, uh, in particular, at the mathematics of uh, distributed optimization. And the mathematics of distributed optimization basically breaks uh, problems down into uh, master problem, sub problem, sub sub problem, and so forth. And it gives us a naturally layered structure that we chose to label uh, the laminar coordination framework 
And by considering that laminar coordination framework, we actually get a set of practical architectural guidelines about the types of uh, information that needs to be exchanged between the layers in, in uh, a layered approach. Um, and you can see that maps onto the grid. We can actually consider the physical topology of the grid relative to such structures. We can also address uh, things like boundary deference and so forth. Uh, going further in that mapping, you see these uh, coordinator nodes are basically the uh, interactions within the levels. Um, uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to show this this morning was with a high high uh, number of devices, especially edge devices with computing capabilities and, and other smart devices spread throughout the system, in order to be able to uh, have these distributed coordination techniques and distributed system, there's a high degree of standardization required at all, at all layers of the system. And this is uh, sort of a new requirement, I think, that we need to step up to as an industry. Don't have a lot of answers for that, but that is the kind of thing we're working on. And um, Terry mentioned uh, uh, when he introduced me the uh, open source ADMS platform, GridAppSD, that we're working on, which is in part trying to address some of those problems. These laminar coordination frameworks and the layered approach give us give us a number of features uh, within that standardized construct of being extensible, supporting boundary deference, uh, the greedy selfish optimization, um, and the ability to uh, uh, be scalable and secure. So that's our sort of quick drive by the grid architecture work. As I mentioned, there's there's a lot more work on that, including a, a new concept we've come up with with something we call a logical energy network, which is a virtualized construct in the electric power system. And that that those reports and um, efforts are all uh, available out on gridarchitecture.pnnl.gov. So now, quick run through the PNNL transactive systems research. So, so Terry started with the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise project, so I'm not going to dwell on that other than just to uh, remind you that was a double auction market that was used to show that we could manage a constrained distribution feeder without, uh, without um, um, going above whatever boundary had been set. That uh, technology was further deployed using the, uh, uh, in the AEP GridSmart project, which was uh, American Electric Power's uh, American Reinvestment Recovery Act project. Uh, in the PGM territory using PGM locational marginal prices as one of the bases for establishing the um, double auction market prices. Also, it was able to do that with uh, constraints in their, uh, in, introduced in their system. That also led us to the Pacific Northwest Smart Grid Demonstration Project where we took a different approach with a forward forecast of uh, cost of power delivered and a forward forecast of load. And uh, through an iteration uh, consensus process between those two, uh, an arrival at an agreed to price at a future point in time for the power that would be delivered. This was a nodal approach. You see the little nodal diagram uh, showing the interaction of any given node with its electrically connected neighbors to exchange the type of information I was just talking about. And post Pacific Northwest Smart Grid Demonstration Project and AEP Grid Smart, then we began a, a set of transactive campus projects, which continue today. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, this uh, looks really uh, behind the meter now, if you will, at a campus and looks at what can be done to coordinate uh, energy consumption across the campus and within the, uh, and within the individual buildings in the campus using uh, transactive techniques. And that gives then the ability to uh, uh, manage both the energy consumption within the campus which has uh, been of great interest to the Building Technology Office in the uh, DOE Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, but it also gives us the opportunity to, in fact, and bring that uh, ability to uh, coordinate flexibility to the meter and work then with the utility on the other side of the meter to offer, uh, offer response to needs expressed by the utility. Uh, we are also doing a uh, project as a part of the DOA Transactive Systems Program. We call it DSOT, Distribution System Operator Plus Transmission. Uh, the idea here is to do a large scale uh, uh, simulation to assess the benefits at large scale within a, within a transmission system of the uh, uh, distribution system operator uh, offering uh, offering uh, flexibility and other services into that transmission system operator. That project is uh, based on ERCOT, uh, and it's actually kind of a mashup of ERCOT and PGM. 
uh, not using ERCOT's markets, but using the, the size of ERCOT, using the roughly the uh, transmission network of ERCOT, and then the distribution systems of ERCOT to be able to be able to do this uh, uh, simulation, which, you, as you can see, is going to include you know uh, a huge number of a huge number of buildings, and then within the buildings, you know, a huge number total number of devices, including over 20,000 electric vehicle chargers, 27,000 rooftop PV installa installations, and and so forth. And this gives us this gives us um, the ability to really do some detailed analysis of of the benefits of the transactive energy system at scale. So for more information about all of this, I've only really been able to give you the 30,000 foot view here because yeah. uh, there was a lot of different material I wanted to cover. But you can uh, find the information about the Gridwise Architecture Council work at gridwiseac.org. There's the TE framework, the TE roadmap, TE decision makers checklist, a recent report we just finished, uh, Smart Buildings as a Transactive Hub, another recent report, Reliability and Resilience Considerations for Transactive Energy Systems. Also invite you all to join us for the seventh international conference and workshop on transactive energy systems, which is now a combined uh, Gridwise Architecture Council and IEEE Power and Energy Society conference. So you can go to the IEEE-TESC.org website. That'll be a virtual conference the week of December uh, 7th. Um, you can also find out more about uh, the transactive energy system simulation platform. Uh, which we're using to do the DSOT work I just mentioned. That's uh, There's a Read the Docs site and a GitHub site for that if you're interested. And last but not least, uh, we're going to be having three transactive theory workshops in September, um, on September 14th, September 16th, and September 17th. Uh, those are three, uh, the, the uh, meat of the discussion broken into three different uh, uh, Times, so it's not the same thing done three times. It's three, you know, a continuing discussion across the three workshops. Uh, those are open to anybody that's interested. We've already got the uh, speakers selected, but their participation is open to anybody who's interested. Uh, if you want to uh, participate, please uh, contact Susan McGuire at uh, PNNL and register with her. So I will. Uh, call it good with that. Thanks for your attention, and I will uh, turn it back over to Terry. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, you caught me up. <laughs> and uh, now uh, we get to hear from uh, Ed Caslett on uh, a real-world experiment uh, conducted with Southern California Edison. There you go, Ed. Thank, thank you, Terry. Let me see if I can uh, there. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to be talking about a pilot of transactive energy that we completed a while back. The report is uh, on the CEC website. At the end of this presentation, there's a list of references that include the links to that report. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to be talking about uh, the current situation in California and what, what, what motivates this type of approach in California. And I'm delighted to be uh, on this panel along with Ron and uh, Terry, who I've uh, interacted with on transactive energy for probably a couple of decades right now. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so let me see if I can move along. So everybody's aware of the uh, rolling blackouts just last week in uh, California. And that's just only the latest of a series of crises in California that call into question how we design our markets. And you know, it goes back to the design of the markets back in 1990 and 1995, which led to the first energy crisis and various crises along the way. So uh, we keep learning from these crises. And I think uh, there's an increase in realization by all of the major entities in California ISO, CPC and CEC and many other parties that the supply side approaches to retail electricity must give away demand side approaches. That is trying to bid in uh, end customer loads and distributed assets into a centralized, essentially a centralized market, dispatch market run by ISO is, is too hard and really pretty inefficient. So we're seeing uh, the concept of capacity or RA in our area has really failed, evidenced by the rolling blackouts to prevent shortages. And it's an expense, in my opinion, expensive and overly complex uh, way to do it, especially now that we have solar storage and EVs 
in the March. What, what's the capacity of a uh, contribution uh, of a, a solar device or even a storage device, depending on its duration? And uh, EVs are, you never know when they're going to come on. So, uh, and then the other observation, not just mine, but others, uh, that distributed energy resource aggregators are were thought to be the solution, but they're they're struggling. They're struggling with low margins and disappearing. They're pivoting to uh, to software. Uh, grid operators have little trust in these aggregations. Incremental incrementality. Are we double paying for RA? Are we paying uh, once through uh, rate incentives, another one through say something like demand response? And then there's the multiple use problem when you have a behind the meter asset and uh, you want it to increase its output or decrease its out output. Uh, who gets to control whether it increases or decreases? Is it the customer, the distribution operator, or the ISO? And then who gets the benefit of that? Just too complicated to think about. So after tw demand side approach, it seems pretty attractive for uh, this is again uh, as focused on demand uh, side resources that, such as uh, behind the meter storage, et cetera. Uh, and after 25 years of trying, what do we have here in California? Lots of interval meters, but we don't use them for much. TOUs just only recently, time of use rates are only just starting to roll out uh, now. And I think you can say that because of their block structure and flexibility, uh, they're too little too late, especially to deal with things like went on last week in the, uh, in the rolling blackouts. Real-time pricing is viewed as a, uh, a solution but it's still years away, if ever, just because of the politics of it. Goal, I think, is tariffs, and I think the key part of the designing transaction system starts with the tariffs. We need tariffs that charge or pay the customer the granular marginal costs, or when we don't have a marginal cost, it's really uh, marginal willingness to pay. We may not have marginal costs because at the margin, most of our assets are becoming fixed cost assets, as solar storage, wires, transformers, et cetera. And there's very little uh, in going forward in California where we're going to 100% renewables or clean energy. There's very little uh, marginal cost. Uh, so it's really which customer is willing to pay more or less for electricity at a given instant. Uh, we need retail tariffs to recover all the allowed fixed and variable costs. So we can't just do a pure marginal cost structure. And we need, uh, we need to think not only about the uh, real-time self-dispatched devices, but the incentives that the, tor the, the tariffs provide for self-investment. So we have two visions of the approach. One division, uh, vision is development of distribution system operators interface with Cal ISO that operate like retail ISOs. And that's more or less, I won't, I won't say it's exactly like uh, what Ron has talked about. The other one is the retail automated transactive energy system approach that I'm about to describe. So here we go. Um, so I, in this context, I define T, transactive energy, TEs, very simply. So it's simply a way to create a decentralized retail electricity market. In that market, all retail parties can buy and sell with their load serving entities or the distribution operators or their peers, peer to peer transactions, if they're permitted. Uh, it is primarily a forward market, hours, days, months, or year ahead, and then with sub hourly transactions for fine tuning. A key element is we define uh, two basic products energy and transport, transport on the distribution grid. It's really, in my opinion, important to separate those two products. Because once you separate those, you find out you can work with a distribution operator that's much like the structure of the current distribution operators and not have to create a DSO that simultaneously has to manage energy as well as uh, the uh, transmission, the distribution grid itself. A big simplification. Other products in this framework, you can not only have the real energy, but reactive energy or, or transact uh, you know, particular flavors of energy, such as green energy or solar energy. In this framework, derivative products such as capacity are not needed, which addresses the resource adequacy problem I just described about. We get by uh, without the uh, derivative products such as capacity by lots of forward contracts and highly dynamic uh, uh, real-time prices. 
So um, next slide. So there's a very small arrow I got to find here. So this is the overall uh, retail system that uh, we, we've piloted in, in large part in our uh, pilot we just completed. Um, at the top, you see the customers and prosumers and distributed generation. In the middle, you see the transactive energy platforms. And at the bottom, you essentially see the supply side, which is the distribution operator, the load serving entity, the California ISO, and the forward uh, wholesale uh, markets uh, in, on the right at the bottom. Um, and so the idea is, uh, in general, offers to buy and sell, I call those tenders, and the forward and spot flow up uh, at various levels of granularity, certainly locational, but also hourly, 15 minute and five minute, through the transactive energy platform to the end devices, where through a standard interface, uh, optimizing agents control individual devices. All the optimization in this framework occurs at the edges. So it's the retail customer having a smart uh, agent is helping him schedule his storage devices, schedule the charging of his car or HVAC. At the bottom, there's optimization going on within the California ISO, uh, et cetera. In the middle of the transactive energy platforms are primarily ledgers. They're ledgers that record the transactions and provide uh, settlement functions and, uh, and standard APIs to uh, uh, allow all the parties to interact. These standard APIs, uh, the protocols for that were developed uh, through the uh, Smart Grid Interoperability Panel and the Energy Interoperation and EMIX Panel, the EMIX Panel, Energy Market Information Exchange, Terry described uh, earlier. Uh, TMIX is, is Energy Market Information Exchange with a T in front of it, it's Transactive Energy Market Information, which is a profile of the standards we developed back with the Smart Grid inter Interoperability Panel. So the transactive energy platforms uh, can manage the transact, record the transactions for uh, the retail transport, the distribution, the energy, and the wholesale energy. Typically, the uh, wholesale energy interface might be operated by the California ISO, the uh, retail energy operated by LSEs, which include community choice aggregators in California, and the distribution operator might uh, would, uh, run the distribution transport project. A distribution operator in this case, as I mentioned, doesn't have to think about dispatching uh, energy. They simply need to price the services on the on their uh, each, each uh, distribution feeder uh, at the locations that the customers receive power. Um, there's a concept I'll describe in a minute of a subscription. You can't just uh, do this with all spot pricing uh, real-time pricing are in 15 minutes because of the volatility that's required to fully represent the, the schedule. So the unique forward contracts are one concept for a forward subscription, which is just a series of hourly uh, quantities of electricity at a fixed monthly price uh, that provides a, a basis for long-term transactions uh, among the parties. Um, so the... Uh, um, each, each, important, each of the uh, agents is not just looking at the current spot price, current uh, prices, but looking forward over whatever horizon of tenders is available typically in the spot market, at least uh, 24 to 36 hours here in California. So I'm going to the next slide. There's this. Having trouble advancing it. I can help. Please. There you go. Okay. So how does rates work? Well, the LSEs uh, frequently offer forward tenders, five minute, hourly, you know, 15 minute, even longer, depending on what's available, via the TE platform to customers. And the LSEs that are essentially acting as market makers, continuously forced to buy and sell tenders, called bid and ask, if you like, uh, that get fed up all the way to end customers and their devices. And so uh, these tender prices are designed to uh, recover uh, 
costs, all costs, and they're typically low when solar and wind is surplus and the circuit is heavily loaded, and high when the opposite is true, solar and wind is scarce or distribution circuit is lightly loaded. On the automated end agents in the, uh, serve the end customers, uh, they, they're, they're tuned to the customer preferences and they schedule the operation of the, uh, of the uh, individual devices. You can do this almost completely automatically with only the occasional in customer input required. But this is very important in terms of customer uh, participation. Typical devices include heat pumps, conventional HVAC, uh, electric vehicles, pumps, water heaters, battery storage, large appliances, data centers, refrigerators, warehouse. Behind the TMX service interface, we don't care what's there. They, they just have to respond to the tenders and, and, respond, and come back with transactions. Devices typically operate or charge more when tenders of prices are low, operate less or discharge when tender prices are high. They're simultaneously doing that in the, uh, each hour, but they're also uh, shifting and shaping the operations of the devices across the hour. So in California, if we've got a surplus of uh, uh, solar in the middle of the day, Tiffany is going to attempt to uh, charge all the stores and EVs and do as much air conditioning at that period of point in time. And then in the evening, when prices may go way up, it's going to tend to uh, ride through there using the thermal inertia of the storage that uh, Terry uh, mentioned. Uh, what's in it for customers? They save money, load better follows available wind and solar supply, and the available distribution customer, which reduces investment in those uh, features, thereby saving further for customers. I'll mention sus subscriptions that reduce the bill volatility, both to the benefit of the customers and to the benefit of the uh, suppliers, DO, DSO, and generators who also prefer revenue stability. Is it, and TV platforms records the transactions and distributed ledgers and computes payments among the parties and energy and transport. And the design of this platform is to scale uh, infinitely. You can have as many T platforms as you want. You as a customer typically would uh, transact with a single platform, but you have the option of connecting up to two platforms in case you want to buy or sell power outside of your local area. Uh, next slide. So this is getting, getting the pilot. The pilot was uh, funded by the California Energy Commission uh, uh, EPIC uh, program. It was a $3.2 million award. It was a proof of concept pilot. It was done jointly between TMEX and Universal Devices with about 100 homes on, on an SE circuit, the Moore Park circuit in, in Los Angeles. The uh, uh, TMEX uh, did the transactive energy side of it. Universal Devices did the devices and uh, the customer uh, interfaces. Uh, the, uh, this is kind of a cartoon of the same the larger diagram we went through where you've got the California ISO interacting with Edison, interacting with the uh, TE platform, flowing tenders up. The tenders go across into the house they received in the TE service interface. There's a, a set of devices um, that are communicated through the uh, uh, universal devices, ISY box, the black box there, that, that talks to each of, the, uh, uh, each of the devices, also talks to the meter. We, uh, the meter in Southern California Edison produces 15 minute readings that we only get after a day or two delay through the green button uh, system. Uh, so we augmented that with five minute readings directed by the Zigbee Han interface. So we have five minute readings, so we have five minute uh, transactions that interface with the five minute markets in the California ISO. Uh, so a set of devices in here, a typical operation would be say, oh, you plug in your car and it knows the forward uh, tender prices in the next five minutes through the next hour, maybe 15 intervals, an hour, each hour through the rest of the day. And it figures out when the cheapest time is to charge it, it starts, it reserves, transacts for all the power required to meet your charge schedule. And then if in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, there's some significant changes on the grid and prices go up or prices go down, it will recontract uh, 
was going to sell back what I might have purchased at one point and uh, and then uh, uh, purchase in another hour that might be cheaper to the benefit of this consumer and to the benefit of the grid because you had a price response. So let's go to the next slide. So this is how the subscriptions come about. Uh, there's many different ways of doing it, but what we did in this uh, 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 study, and this is at the top of the screen, is we said, let's give the customers uh, an amount of power each hour of the next year that's based on their historical, their typical uh, consumption. So if you're a solar customer in January, you have a particular 24-hour uh, shape to your load. So you get that amount of power in every, every uh, day in January at a fixed price, fixed monthly cost for January, not a price, but a cost. Same for the other months. So that gives you uh, uh, a, a fixed uh, schedule of costs and revenues to the utility. And then if in any interval you use more than that, you can purchase it or you'll automatically purchase it at the uh, tender prices. If you use less, you get paid at the tender prices and the tender for two tender prices are close together. So, and how do we get the tender prices? Well, what we did in the uh, SE pilot is, is this working closely with uh, some of the rate makers and marginal cost expert at SCE who said, okay, for the delivery portion, that's the distribution portion on the circuit, that uh, we want to recover so many dollars per year, say uh, 400, uh, say $400 a kilowatt year on the circuit, um, um, megawatt year. And so let's recover more of that when circuits more heavily loaded and less when it's lightly loaded. And, and, they can, and if it's very lightly loaded, the, uh, the, uh, uh, they don't want the circuit to go below a given level, so they want the price to go negative. So, so the, there's a, a curve that's created, and we create that curve using their judgment, my judgment, and then we scale that curve, curve based on the forecasted uh, loads on that circuit to recover approximately the annual fixed uh, cost of that circuit, uh, and um, and then update that from year to year. We also add to that the losses on the circuit based on the marginal cost, marginal uh, losses, and the uh, Cal, Cal ISO uh, energy price for the fixed uh, for the, uh, uh, the fixed costs that are not included in the LMP from the ISO. They broke it into two parts. One was the base generation cost, so the similar concept to the fixed cost recovery for, for delivery, where the recovery increased as a function of the total load on the grid. And for the flex portion of that, so we looked at the three hour ramp, and they said, say 40% of their costs are fixed for, uh, for flex and 60% for generation. That was the rate making assumption. We recover more of that. 40% of the fixed cost for flex when the, the three R ramps are highest. So we put all that together plus the LMP from the ISO, and that's what the tender price is. The buy price and sell price are slightly different. So this recovers all the costs and reflects uh, essentially marginal costs on the grid. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to go through some of the uh, uh, results from the, the project here. This is what the tender prices looked like for the first 31 days of March 2019. You can see big spikes in the uh, in around 6 p.m. A, a, a slight morning uh, spike. Sometimes the prices went down near zero. And these are retail prices, so including the distribution, the distribution operator costs, and the uh, SEE fixed costs. This is what scarcity pricing does for you. Very dynamic price signal. Why, that's why we need the uh, uh, price, the uh, subscription component, because you're getting paid this price if you use less uh, when the, uh, less than what you subscribe to and you get, you get paid and you pay this price if you use more than what you subscribe to. Next slide, please. So this, this is another chart. I'll, I'll kind of indicate the scales on the side because it's hard to read. 
So this is just from this past week when we had the problems on the, uh, the California grid. And you can see the top case, case is the uh, uh, is the LNP from the ISO grid. And you see in the first couple of days, the two spikes are very low. That's typical operation. And then the last few days, the spikes from the uh, LNPs are, are fairly low. And in the middle, we had some bigger spikes that went up to 1,000, then to 1,500. These are for the Pino, the location in Southern California War Park circuit, that went up uh, one day all the way to about $1,500 a megawatt hour. And that's way higher than what you typically see. Next comment, component below that is the base generation cost, of recovery of the fixed generation cost, which vary a lot with load. You see that in the middle there, they're much higher than at the ends. Next, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, next we have the, uh, the flex generation cost, and you see it was high at the end, but in the middle of the summer, what happens is you don't have big ramps because it's just high load every day, so it's just continually increasing. So the flex becomes less important in the summer. It's more the base generation cost recovery and the uh, LMPs. Uh, below there, you have the, uh, that's the total LSE price, adding up the three uh, curves above. You add in the distribution operator, uh, transport costs, and that's going up in the middle because of the high cost of losses on the grid because the, you're paying $1,500 or, or uh, $7,000 megawatt hour for the, uh, the losses. Finally, down the bottom, you have the totals. And so they're very different every day. Try to fit a time of use price to that price. Or, you know, it's, it's really different every day. It shows you the benefit. And every, every month of the year, it's just, you know, things are very... Uh, Interesting. Next slide, please. So this shows the operation of the pool pump. The red is when the pool pump's on. Across the top, you have the, uh, the there's uh, five days, one, two, three, four, six days in January of 2019. Down, down the side, you have 24 hours, and it's red when it's on. So every day, the operation is, this pump is different. Uh, op operating optimizing from the point of view of saving money for the customer. Next slide. This is the operation of behind the meter storage battery with an agent that uh, optimized the operation of that. The blue uh, case, and this is for two days. The blue is where it uh, indicates the discharge. The orange is what indicates the charge, and you can see the gray is the stated charge going up and down through the day. Below that are the price tender prices to uh, produce that result. So you virtually always get uh, substantial discharge in the morning and the evening in this case, and charging in between at low prices. On the left, you see the uh, battery specifications and the red first day and secondary revenues. Next slide. This shows the operation of the heat pump in uh, heating mode, and uh, the uh, uh, up the top, we have the temperatures. In the middle, we have the kilowatts of uh, uh, power used by the heat pump. And below, we have the tender prices that motivated this operation. The, uh, uh, the, uh, you can see that if you look at the kilowatts, uh, it avoided all the high price time, times pretty much. Uh, it's different each day because of the outside temperature being different. And you can see the orange up at the top shows the deviation from their customer's preferred point of, of uh, 74 degrees in this. And it uh, shows that uh, this, the deviation is controlled by essentially a slider or uh, preference that the customer sets from time to time for more comfort or more savings. Next slide. Hey, at a quick time check, can you wrap this up in about uh, two minutes? Yes, I can. Thank you. So this this shows uh, the operation of a uh, uh, EV Tesla Model S, and uh, at the middle of the uh, uh, top of the tender price is every five minutes. Now, when you start charging, it's, you're plugging in at six it's six thirty at night or something. And you say by seven thirty next morning, I want a seventy five percent charge. It shows you the in the middle of the five five minute charges finding the cheapest places, adjusting it through the night, and the state of charge is at the bottom. It goes up. Next slide. This shows the same uh, EV 
charging over a period of uh, uh, about 10 days. It was unplugged. It goes down through uh, the load and it's uh, off, and then you'll see it getting charged. And it gets charged when you look down the bottom at various uh, at where, where you see the prices and literally see the charges. So it optimally operates uh, that charging. Next slide. So, uh, in summary, uh, the, the RACE, uh, RACE project achieved its goal of a proof of concept and work to design. We had lots of implementation challenges and procurement delays to overcome, but we, we got through it and we got it done. Our goals in California, 100% clean energy and electrification, a huge need for flexibility, uh, demand side price response, and will work as evidenced by this. Uh, this uh, project. CEC 2020 load management rulemaking is, is working to require opt-in dynamic real-time pricing tariffs by the utilities by 2022 or so. Uh, however, I believe it needs tenders and transactions to be effective. You can't just do this sort of peer pricing approach at scale. Renewable storage and wires are mostly fixed cost. Best to recover such costs with a scarcity pricing concept. Resource adequate and build stability, you need the forward subscription process. That's going to work a lot better than the arbitrary resource adequate rules we have to come up with. And we need end-to-end -end automation for customer convenience savings and simplified billing and operations. So thank you. There's two or three additional slides. One is a bunch of references. Others is kind of a roadmap for getting California in summary of benefits. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Boy, we've got a bunch of questions. Uh, but we also have a panelist joining us. Uh, 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 Paul Hines is an associate professor of engineering at the University of Vermont and wears a second hat <clears throat> uh, as the CEO of Packetized Energy, a company that is uh, also working on transactive style uh, integration of, of End uses uh, end use flexibility. Uh, I'll give him a, a little bit to uh, figure out if he has a question, and uh, and I will pick a question from uh, the the many that have been uh, submitted so far. The the uh, there's a question about uh, we we I think. Last session or two sessions ago on this webinar series, there was a series of presentations on the application of uh, blockchain and other sort of open source approaches to racking up uh, all of this information. And I wonder how the panel um, thinks about the application of blockchain to the kinds of things you've described. Um, I can go first. Uh, the blockchain. Uh, think of that as an application that sits on, that is a essentially a distributed database, just like the TeamX platform we use in the middle is a distributed database. You could substitute blockchain for that distributed database, but you'd still have a TE application layer. layer. Sometimes they want to use smart contracts. I find blockchain, and I've tried it, uh, too slow, too expensive, too hard to work with in its current state. And so it offers no advantage over the highly secure distributed commercial databases I can use in transactive energy that are available from any number of Microsoft and, and uh, other vendors. So for now, it, it, it's, you got to distinguish TE from blockchain. Blockchain is essentially a distributed database that could enable TE. Yeah, I know I got to pile on with Ed here. You know, blockchain offers you dis distributed secure ledger. And, and again, possibly, as Ed mentioned, the uh, smart contracts may be a way to trigger trigger an event, but uh, there's a lot more to uh, successful TE systems and technologies than a, a secure ledger and being able to trigger a contract to execute. So uh, the, the real work of TE yeah. is in the logic and the functionality to make the decisions about what, what to do and what not to do in the marketplace. Yeah, thanks. Paul, you got a question? I'll, a I'll, 
first <laughs> say that we're I'm in vigorous agreement on that one. I I think that we've looked at blockchain and and uh, just haven't found it to be a cost effective solution. I think with uh, anything that we do in this space, it really have to focus on figuring out how to make it cost effective uh, relative to other solutions. So um, yeah, we we haven't found it to be better than just using a good database. Um, I do have a question though. And one of the things that we're finding is really important for making uh, these demand side flexibility programs cost effective is making the experience for the consumer really good so that, that everyone wants to join. And um, one of the concerns I've had about some of the transactive energy things is just really hard for people to understand what's going on. So I guess, you know, maybe Ed or others, how do you make this easy for people to understand and join? Well, they, yeah, they don't need to understand it. Current, they're on a current tariff. Maybe it's flat, maybe it's time of use. It, this is just from their point of view, a new tariff. And the prices vary and they get, uh, they can go out and buy a therm smart thermostat if they like. They don't have to. And that thermostat can be pre-programmed to communicate, uh, to pick up the, the, uh, the tenders and communicate with the platform, the operation of that thermostat. They have one control over that. It could be in the thermostat, or you can say to the, the smart speaker, increase my comfort uh, uh, level or decrease my comfort level, increase my savings level, decrease my savings. That's all. And they might do that once or a couple times a year. That's it for that. The rest of the stuff, like operating a pool pump, you say how many hours per day you need, you might change that seasonally through a voice interface, and uh, your car, you plug it in and, and say when you want it to what charge level, and that interface is probably in the car interface today, and it, it operates that. So very little change for the customer. Yeah, and I, I uh, going all the way back to the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise demonstration project where we offered the customer a uh, smart thermostat that basically the setting they got to choose was a slider, more comfort, more savings. They moved the slider whatever direction they wanted to at, at any given point in time. And that uh, picked a point on the price elasticity curve that was embedded in the smart, smart thermostat functionality. You know, the other, Paul, the other comment I have about your question, you know, I, I hear, especially within the electric vehicle charging sort of discussions, talk about time of use prices and sort of expecting our customers then to, you know, either set a timer on their car or something like that to, to take advantage of a time of use price, which I think is a lot more complicated than, than the type of thing Ed was just talking about, which is, hey, I want the car to be fully charged by 6 a.m. I don't care how it gets charged as long as it gets charged by 6 a.m. That's the parameter I set, and then uh, you know automated automated uh, systems take care of the rest and can take care of the you know the potential benefits uh, between the car charging and the utilities needs and any any you know uh, financial side of those benefits that accrue to the customer are accrued, and uh, the customer doesn't have to worry about it. It's, it's just a, a state and objective, and then step back and let the system do its job. Yeah, good point. Um, so I've got another question here. Uh, it, it, it's sort of a series. It's it's a sort of nested version of a question, and it relates to um, microgrids and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. How how do you see that uh, working in a transactive energy system? Um, I can go take it on, but I'm sure Ron's got some views. So. Let's say in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, if you take the rate system the way it's set up, and if you have a the market makers, the LSE or the and the DO continually making a market, in other words, having buy and sell prices, and and if that's true, say in the uh, real-time market, then there's not not much advantage for peer-to-peer -peer transactions because you can sell it to your neighbor uh, for about the same price you get it yourself. Where the advantage of peer-to-peer we come in terms of long-term investments. I want to put up a solar system in my house. The neighbor doesn't have roof space. We share the costs and we write a subscription, a contract that says shares the output of those between the two on a peer-to-peer -peer system. And so one of the advantages of the rate structures we built into rates is that would, you could still do those peer-to-peer -peer transactions and the utility would still be recovering its costs under the transactive subscription transactive tariff. 
So they wouldn't have any objection to that process as they do now uh, under current rates. Hello? Micro goods would be the same thing. I, maybe the, I'll, I'll add one thought to that that's kind of related is we, you know, we have a distributed algorithm that we do in our system, but we haven't really done it using prices as the primary signal. We're using a variety of different signals, and we think of our transactive energy system as a contracts to devices approach rather than prices to devices. So we're not always pushing prices. It's, and we like that approach because, you know, we don't have to do as much complicated peer-to-peer -peer stuff. And um, and it allows us to do that, you know, get a similar customer experience where they're choosing like high, medium, low flexibility, um, but they have a kind of a known amount of value that they get out of that so that they can choose high flexibility. That's, you know, t the 10 bucks a month of savings and low flexibility is $2 a month of savings. And they just can really, you know, easily make those trade-offs. So, um, but, I, you know, I know there's lots of different ways to solve this problem, but I want to just if we're going to do peer to peer, we have to really figure out how to make it super simple for the customer. Yeah, I'll, I'll be right up front. I'm not a big fan of peer to peer. I think it, I, I, I don't actually think the economics will pencil out for individual consumers in the long run. And it may, may be something that sort of is uh, early adopter interesting sort of stuff, but that for most people, it would probably never really uh, pencil out well. And, and quite frankly, it also may obfuscate the real needs uh, in our energy economies, and that is to be able to support, you know, deep decarbonization. If somebody can make make an argument why, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, truly supports uh, a, a reliable and secure uh, system that's deeply decarbonized, then I'm all for it. But I really am skeptical that such an argument can be made. I've got another set of questions about sort of differentiating um, uh, electric vehicle integration versus battery storage versus sort of thermal mass uh, benefits of, of transactive energy. Well, so the so transactive energy systems are, are are not an end unto themselves. I've been waiting for a chance to say that. I think this is the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question with storage is, you know, is the coordination that one can achieve through a transactive energy system approach to coordinate the behavior of the storage system relative to other operational <clears throat> objectives that can be stated and monetized to provide the basis for price signals to uh, incentivize the behavior of the storage system, is that the most uh, op optimum and efficient way to get those behaviors that are that are uh, beneficial to the owner of the storage system, to the operator of the grid, and society overall to come into play. And uh, I tend to think that TE is a great way to do that, but but one should keep in mind that you do really have to start with what's the op you know, what are the objectives of having the storage system in the first place, especially by whoever has made the investment in the storage system. And then do to TE systems offer a an approach to achieve those objectives. I, I, I generally agree. The uh, key things say take uh, take storage or behind the meter storage. Okay. They're you got lots of different technologies. Everyone's a different state of charge. All the customers have different reasons for having a storage device. And try and aggregate those and bid them in as a virtual storage device, perhaps throwing in demand response and uh, you know, HVAC shifting into kind of the virtual storage plant and you're bidding into Cal ISO, for example, is really, really hard to do. You lose a lot of granularity in the information that the customers are concerned about. On the other hand, if you take the demand side price responsive approach, you can have very, uh, uh, very fine grain uh, operation taking account of each individual storage device's situation or the customer preferences and still get, I think, much higher responsiveness for, to meet the grid needs from the Cal ISO. I just uh, biggest agreement. I really liked what Ron said about we need to think about what the ends are. I mean, 
you know, Terry's quote, I, I don't know if you shared this one today, but like we need wiggly load because we've got wiggly generation coming is, is key. And the, you know, the whether it's transactive energy, prices, devices, quantum, whatever it is, whatever the structure, the goal is to figure out how do we get enormous amounts of flexibility into the system so that we can solve the grid problems and make it affordable and get to lots of renewable energy. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that we, we should try lots of different ways to get there and figure out what works and do those. And unfortunately, I have to run from there. So thank you for the <laughs> invitation to join the frequent. Good to see you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. So uh, when we uh, began exploring what uh, uh, transactive energy could do, uh, and we, we didn't really have an idea of how wiggly generation was going to be, <laughs> and it turns out to be really important. Uh, but we also thought that this was something that was so obvious that utilities would pretty well adopt it within, you know, 10 years or so, and it's been a long time. <laughs> so the question came up, uh, which, which utilities in the U.S. or globally would be most interested in this? And, and I got an answer from Portland General, uh, who's launched a set of three uh, uh, smart grid pilot projects. Uh, Larry Beckadal there says, uh, yeah, it is the future. We are going there, but we're not going to call it that. <laughs> anyway, to the remaining <laughs> panelists. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 can I can report that I don't know that, I don't know how public the information is, so I'm not going to name them, but there is a large East Coast utility, a very large East Coast utility that is uh, laying, laying the groundwork for implementing transactive energy solutions in their, in their system. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it, as uh, every utility you look at, there's different silos of interest, you know, and it, it's, it just takes time uh, in the large utilities. So I think you know, many of the smaller utilities are going to find transactive energy much more interesting, particularly, you know, uh, if, if we can make it simple and cheap to implement because they can more quickly get around the po internal politics. I think the, at least in California, I think the move to transactive energy uh, won't be driven by utility interests, but uh, by regulator interests, both in the California Energy Commission and the CPUC, because they're struggling to keep the system uh, operational, uh, mm -hmm. as pretty evidenced by the problems in the beginning of August here. So Terry, yeah. you know, I mentioned I mentioned in my presentation the report by uh, Paul DiMartini and Lorenzo Kristoff on the future uh, electric utility regulators project that yeah. defined the three stages of deployment of DER, and and I really think um, until you get to high uh, high levels of deployment DER that are in fact creating uh, operationally a distribution system that's very difficult to operate without new approaches. I, I don't think you have uh, necessarily a huge motivation by many utilities to adopt a TE type approach because they can get by with traditional central optimization and, and voltage management and things like that, that you know, they don't have a compelling economic reason to change their operational strategy. But once you get to high levels of deployment of DER uh, that, that um, are causing some sort of operational pain and suffering that can't be alleviated with just more of the same. I think then there will be a lot more motivation on the utilities part to, to adopt uh, highly, highly distributed approaches that, that include um, use of economic signals. So that, that's a point where uh, I, I debated Paul DiMartini on that a few times. I have a completely opposite view of that curve. The, the right way to start is to fix the tariffs. If you get the tariffs and get at least some progress towards a highly dynamic tariff, hopefully based on transactive energy, then you'll start making the right investments, both on the customer side, because they'll see the value of storage, the value of solar, uh, et cetera, EVs, and on the, on the supply side, because they won't have to expand circuits because people are charging their cars at the wrong time, or they're not, putting, not pairing their solar with storage. So unless we get both sides making good decisions on early on, both the investment and the operational side, uh, and we can only do that if we get the prices right, and that's the tariff. 
And the tariffs, they're politically hard to change, but they're cheap to change because you don't have to put steel in <laughs> the ground to fix a tariff. Well, I guess, Ed, Ed I, I, I agree with at least some of what you said, but the, the challenge, I think, is um, sort of that changing the tariff part uh, in which I think you really need to be able to start with some operational objectives and then be able to create the tariffs to support achieving the operational objectives. And so you get kind of in a you know chicken, chicken or the egg, which came first sort of a situation. So I, I tend to think that operational requirements are going to drive it, and I think you, you tend to come at it from the other side. But the two, are, two have to be taken together at the end. And with that, mm -hmm. thanks to <laughs> this excellent uh, set of presentations, what a fascinating topic for me anyway, and apparently uh, for 40 some odd <laughs> participants. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Omar and Lang. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you, Terry, and to Ron, Ed, and Paul. That was a uh, fantastic panel. I think we had, I think we broke a record for most questions asked. Uh, in fact, I know we did. So, uh, Terry, that's obviously a testament to your, uh, your, your great moderating skills. And uh, this was a great session, a great way to uh, round out uh, this, this webinar series. So, again, thank you to our panelists. Uh, here today. Just want to take a step back and uh, just uh, through this digital webinar series, starting with our workshops in June through this summer, uh, and, and speaking on, on behalf of, uh, you know, Liang and, and all the great folks at Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative and, and us at EPRI, you know, uh, you know, with us as, as the hosts, and I want to give a special shout out to uh, VMware uh, for their uh, contributions uh, for uh, the initial webinars and, and throughout, they, they have been an active participant. So I wanted to make sure that uh, I appreciate, uh, uh, we extend our appreciation to, to VMware. But uh, through these 12 webinars, uh, over 42 speakers, uh, 800 plus attendees, if we count, uh, you know, the attendance of each one, um, which you know we had a lot of common uh, people that have been attending regularly. But I think it's just a testament to the, uh, Interest level in this uh, in this area, and uh, again, I just want to thank uh, thank everyone, all of the attendees, um, all of our uh, distinguished speakers and moderators throughout these 12 uh, sessions. I, and I want to give a special special uh, shout out to Aurelie Bear uh, from EPRI and Wahila Wilkie from Stanford. Uh, they are the ones that have been uh, making sure that everything works well behind the scenes. Um, orally for making sure that these webinars actually function, and uh, uh, we could not do this without you and Wahila for uh, doing so much with the organization and uh, reach out to the speakers and uh, and everything else. So uh, if everyone could just give a, a virtual uh, hand to Orly and and Wahila, uh, they did a great job, and uh, it's been it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful experience. Absolutely, um, I just want to just say, okay, we laid this great foundation. We've We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, where do we go from here? And I think we definitely intend to continue this, this momentum in, in, in a few ways. First, uh, we're going to maintain this repository of presentations and, and webinar recordings. Um, and they are accessible from both the EPRI site and with links uh, uh, with the Stanford site also having links to, the, to those sites as well. Uh, we will migrate that to a more permanent home, and we'll make sure that uh, everyone has that, uh, that permanent link. But they will remain accessible uh, because it's a, it's a real library that, that, uh, that we've uh, developed together. Um, we also intend to launch interest groups to sustain this engagement that we've uh, developed through these webinar series. Uh, and what we're envisioning is a, a, an interest group for uh, the utilities to, to join and participate in and to uh, provide some backing in so that we can keep this a self-sustaining activity and for uh, a stakeholder group because we have really through these webinars, we have a whole ecosystem of experts uh, that have been uh, brought together, including uh, uh, academic leaders, researchers, uh, industry technology leaders from the large companies to startups and everything in between, 
uh, to government agencies, uh, to uh, thought leaders in, in various related disciplines. So we want to have a, a, a home for that group to continue to meet and engage uh, both uh, amongst themselves and also with, with, with the utilities. So we're going to be working, uh, you know, EPRI and Stanford together to, to uh, build on the foundation that we've set here to enable this uh, sharing of ideas and best practices to continue in a structured way so that we're uh, advancing a, a research roadmap around um, digital grid development, specifically <clears throat> enabling the enabling data platforms that are needed to uh, allow the types of, you know, transactive energy uh, architectures that have been talked about here today. Uh, part of those interest groups are intended to incubate uh, projects, pilots, demonstrations that say are, are born out of the um, recommendations from, from these groups uh, so that we can, again, push the ball further down the field to, towards that end and ultimately to, to transform uh, the industry. Uh, this is a big lift and it's bigger than any one uh, company and any one uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so this these webinars have really been a, a testament to, to that fact. So again, I want to express my appreciation. We will be sending out a survey um, that'll be forthcoming. We're going to be sending it to everyone who has participated in any one of these uh, these webinars uh, to get your feedback on them um, and recommendations on these next steps, including what we laid out here, but in a little bit more more detail. So there will be further information on that. With that, uh, if Liang, if you want to sh uh, uh, put your video back on, I want to personally thank you and, and, and Bits and Watts for, for all that you've done. And uh, again, thanks to all the, all the panelists. And uh, Liang, would you like to say any final words before we, before we close? Just very quick. Thank you, uh, Ron, Ed, and Terry again uh, for contributing to this webinar. And thank you all of you uh, who attended the webinar series in the past. Really appreciate your support. As Omar said, well, it's a time for us, we've done the conversation, it's a time for us to rolling up our sleeve and then we'll do some work. And we will do it in an open and a collaborative way because both APRE and uh, uh, Stanford University will have the mission, which is do something good for the public interest. Thank you again for your support. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.